All right, in this lesson, what we're going to be doing is creating the actual Medusa combo. Now, the first thing you need to recognize is we already have the Medusa combo folder created. So if under our UT2K4 folder, we have the Medusa combo folder, which is our project, if you will. And if we go inside of it, you'll notice we have the classes folder. Inside classes folder, we have nothing. That's because, well, we haven't created anything yet. So let's go ahead and create the first file that we need. So right click, new, and we'll just create a simple text file. And we'll name this Medusa combo.uc. So let's drag this into context. And now let's start typing. So of course, for the very first thing, this is going to be class Medusa combo. And it's going to extend what? Combo. Because this is our main combo file. So while I'm typing here, Logan is probably going to be doing most of the explaining because, well, I have a hard time typing and explaining at the same time. So why don't you take it away, Logan? All right. Well, the first thing that we're going to do is set up a few variables that we'll be using later. Uh, for example, there's, we're going to have an adjustable range, at least adjustable from the default properties, to make uh, tweaking easier later. But we're going to set up a float to hold the effect range, meaning how close someone has to be to you before they actually get frozen. All right. We're also going to set up um, a one other variable to, this will just be used so we can keep track of who activated the combo. Um, in certain functions, you're just, you're told who is activating it, but we're actually going to uh, be needing to add our own function later, and we'll need access to who, uh, who is causing this effect, or who, who activated the combo, basically. Right. And then we're also going to uh, have a, a sound and an effect to go with it. Um, again, just to give, it's, it helps for tweaking later because it's, it's kind of nice to have something visual to see like what happens. So if you get frozen, you actually see that something happened. You're not just like, okay, why did my game So when, it, when the player is frozen, when a player is frozen, there's a free sound and then there's going to be another effect. Right. So All we're right. just setting up variables to hold those. Again, you could do, you could just directly reference a certain sound, but this way it gives us the ability to use a default property as opposed to hard coding it. Somewhere. Ah, very true. So the next one is just our effect. So we're just going to hold a class. In this case, we're going to limit the class to X emitter, and we're going to set that to, or we're going to call that variable freeze effect. So in the default properties, we can set it to some X emitter, and uh, and use any X emitter we want to for the class for when something gets frozen. And now before we create the functions, why don't we go ahead and say the main functions needed for every single combo? Well, there's two functions that get called in the combo. You have a function start effect and a function a uh, function end effect. Or stop These, effect. Yes, or stop effect. And what, what this means is, as soon as you activate the combo, the start effect gets called. So this is where you uh, set up certain things, or like in, in existing combos where you s like begin doing something. If the player was to, say, die or explode when you activated the combo, if you wanted to make like a uh, kamikaze right. combo, you could just have the start effect and then spawn a redeemer explosion at your player's location. <laughs> right. And of course, we also, we also have end effect, which is called if either A, you run out of adrenaline, or B, you get killed or otherwise die. Then the stop effect gets called. All right. So, you know what? My, before we do anything, let's go ahead and set up a few default properties. So let's create our default properties area, bracket that off, and we'll just set up our effect range at first. So our effect range, we'll just set this equal to, say, 500, just some random value that you can change and tweak depending on how you want to set it up. And we'll set up the free sound as well. So free sound, we'll just equal this to sound, and we'll get a slaughter sound going on here. So slaughter sounds, machinery dot heavy end, something like that. And for our freeze effect, so we'll just call this freeze effect class again. We just defined these up here. So we're just um, setting up their default properties. And, you know, we really need some elevator music, as we always do, at these times where we're typing and trying to get something cool. All right, so those are our basic um, default properties. We do have more. But before we get to those, let's go ahead and start putting in the main functions that we need. And the first one is going to be our start effect. So we can come in here and just say function and start effect. And it's past one argument, and that's going to be x pawn p. Yes, this is uh, simply because you, like, normally uh, all the existing combos do something to the player in question that activated the combo, like give them more speed or health or make them do more damage. So it's, it's just convenient to have access to who caused this combo. That's right. So in this case, what we're going to do is set a timer 
And why don't you tell us a little bit about this? Well, what we're doing with set timer is we're going to need to keep a constant check running for who's who's near you, and we're going to set that to do that check every 0.3 seconds. And uh, we'll, and tr the other uh, pro uh, parameter of set timer is true. That means it will it's it'll loop. It'll keep doing it. If you do set timer 0.3 false, it'll just hit the timer function once after 0.3 seconds and then stop. Right. And then of course the second thing is just setting the instigator pawn, which we defined up here, equal to what was passed to us so that we can use this later. And this is simply because in timer we aren't past x pawn p. That's why we need to keep track of it so that once we're within timer we're still aware of who caused this combo. Right. So now that we have the set timer set up to be called every point three, um, well now we need to actually go ahead and use function timer. Right. Because we've got the timer started and what that's going to do is call the timer function. So we're going to overload timer and then do whatever we want to do. In this, in our case, we're going to do the check to see who's around us, and or what's around us, and if what are, uh, and if that's a player or not. So the first thing is let's set up a few local variables so that we can um, s have something to work with, if you will. So the first one's going to be our x pawn p, and we'll just we'll, uh, we'll be using that as we scan through what uh, is currently around us. It'll just temporarily hold every object around us as we're going through it. You'll see that in just a second. So now we've got the uh, vector of the instigator and uh, and other. What we're going to be doing using these for is to tell which way the per uh, person using the combo is looking and the way the person that is within the radius is looking. Once so we can calculate those two players and check to see if they're looking at each other. Exactly. So again, we're just going to create another float that's going to store the angle so we can test this angle to see if we're pointing at each other. And then we can go ahead and actually start working. So we can say instigator, and hopefully I'm not spelling all this wrong, instigator direction. Now, of course, this is only going to meet, we're going to, we're about to set up a loop that checks for every single pawn within our effect range. But right now, we only need for our instigator, this is a one-time check. This is not needed to be changed every single time during the loop. Right, I mean, we're just saying, okay, in this current check of the timer, the first thing we're going to do is see where the person using the combo is looking. And to do that, we'll simply typecast the uh, the rotator or the uh, instigator's rotation, just to see which way they're looking, and we'll throw that in uh, instigator direction. So now is the big loop that we need to do, and of course this is an iterator, so we're going to use for each, and the iterator we're going to be calling is visible colliding actors. And the reason that was chosen is simply because uh, first the way it works by using the collision hash, which would be easier than going through every single actor in the level or every single dynamic actor. Just to kind of narrow the uh, search down, since we are going to be doing this every 0.3 seconds, we want to try to keep the iterator as light as possible. And this is one other thing to point out. You may be wondering why we're running an iterator within a timer and running it so often. Um, to achieve this effect, there's, there's various ways we could go about doing this. Because like we said before, the goal is to keep a running check going of who's close to you. And if they're close to you and looking at you, they get frozen. Now, and you're looking at them. Right? Yeah. Now, of course, you could uh, you could pull that off doing uh, different methods. You could actually go and make your own uh, pawn that ran these checks instead. But uh, what we're doing here is simply keeping the, uh, for demonstration purposes, keeping the number of classes simple. So we're going to be doing everything within the combo class instead of spreading out to all different kinds of actors and pawns and whatnot. Right. So the first thing that we want to pass to our visible colliding actors iterator is going to be which kind of class we're looking for, and that's going to be x pawn. And the second one is going to be p, and this is for an iterator, it's putting what it's finding inside of p as we define a local variable x pawn p. So it's going to be putting every single one within the range inside of p. Yes, yeah, so basically we've got the base class set to x pawn, so only only looking through anything that is an x pawn or subclass is x pawn. And every time we find one, every time it goes through and it finds an x pawn, that's uh, stored in p. Right. So as we're looking at this current iteration, p will be whatever current object is close to us, or in this case, x pawn. And the third argument is going to be the effect range. So since we've already defined an effect range variable, we'll just put that in there. Of course, we could hard code it, but we don't like doing that. So this is the range in which to do that collision hash check. Anything within the effect range will be checked to see if it's a colliding actor. That's right. Or in our case, a colliding x pawn. And this last one. So, and then the last property we can give it is, okay, we've specified a radius in which it should check, but where should it base that radius from? If we don't tell it to keep track of where the player is, it's actually going to be doing that check from wherever the combo itself spawns. So meaning right. when you activated the combo, 
that posi wherever you were standing when you activated it would be where it's doing the test from. We want to make sure that it always does the test from where you're currently standing. So now that we've defined our loop, we can define the inside, the meat of it, where everything is going to happen. So the first thing we want to check is to make sure, since visible colliding actors is looping through every single exponent within a certain radius, it's, it could find us. So, exactly. So we want to make sure that the current one, what's inside of P, is not equal to the instigator, us, the instigator pawn. So we want to say if... Yeah, that wouldn't be too much fun if you activate this combo and all of a sudden you're frozen. Yeah, that would be a bad thing. So we're going to say if P does not equal instigator pawn. So instigator pawn. So here's uh, yeah another case where you're using that instigator pawn. So instigator pawn is always us or whoever activated it. That's right. So are we looking at the guy who activated the combo? In this case, no. So now that we are inside of, the, uh, inside of this if statement, that means that we are not looking at ourselves. We can go in here and say other dir, which we defined right up here. We can say other dir equals, and then of course we're going to cast it, and then say p dot rotation, just as we yeah. did up here. Just like when we got the instigator direction. Now we've we've got we're getting into other x pawns that are not ourselves. So now we need to start checking all these people that are within the radius and see if they're looking at us or not. That's right. So we can come in here and just say angle, which is the local variable we defined above, and just say pi, which is a constant that is defined, pi minus a cosine, which is our cosine, and say instigator. So this is going to be defining. Um, the angle between these two. So instigator dir dot and then other dir. So what is so this doing? Well, basically so getting the dot product of the two directions so we can see what the relation is of those two directions or two angles. Right, if you remember from good old trig days, instigator direction, which we've defined up here, which is ourselves, dot other dir, which is the other guy that we're looking at. We take the dot product of those two find the arc cosine of it, and then take pi minus that because, well, basically the two are pointing opposite to each other, so if you take pi minus that, and then the angle is going to be um, checked based on that. So we want it to be a degree pi minus four, pi divided by four. I hope this is making sense. When I start rambling on math type stuff, I just kind of go off on a tangent. Sorry, guys. So this will make sense in a second. Right now, when we get to this point, angle is holding the distance between um, the two characters. So basically, if angle is going to be less than pi divided by 4, and remember, pi is 180 degrees. So if you divide by that, that by 2, what you get is 90. Divide that by 4, and what you're going to get is... Is... 45. Pi divided by 4, that's 2. Um, and what you're going to get is 45 degrees. So pi divided by 4 is 45 degrees. So if we come into here and say, if angle is less than pi divided by 4, what that means is it has... It doesn't that mean... Well, pi would mean 360. So no, pi is um, 180. Uh, oh, two two so pi is 360, pi. right. So inside of here, that's going to mean it's 45 degrees. So pi angle is less than 45 degrees. So within that radius, we're going to check and say, okay, that player is within our visible range of 45 degrees. Freeze that guy. Well, not only that but also that they're, they're within our radius and they're, uh, they're looking at us. So the difference between those, so basically the two view radius are looking at each other. That's right. Well, basically the field of view is, is within. 45 other. degrees, right. So, and make sure, also we want to check to make sure p.ground speed. Now what this is doing is, so if someone comes within the radius and they're looking at you and they get frozen, well, this, this check continues every 0.3 seconds. So we don't want to keep freezing them over and over and over again since we have effects. We can see the, uh, the visual effect that gets spawned around them. So what we want to do is uh, make sure that once they're frozen, they only get frozen once. Right. So let's go into here. Now that we're inside of here, we know that we want this person to be frozen. So what we're going to do is say P dot ground speed, the guy that's looking at us and the guy we're looking at, is going to excuse me, equal 0.1. So that's that's part of the effect. The other thing we're going to be doing is setting uh, p or setting the physics of whoever was looking at us, and this is where the most noticeable freeze effect happens. If we set the uh, physics to uh, physics none, that will uh, it'll actually freeze them in midair as well as disallowing them to run around or jump or anything. Now the reason we included ground speed equals 0.1 as well is in case something would happen, like possibly like 
taking damage, or especially in the case of a bot, which can sometimes get away from that, or actually set its own physics, like, like trying to jump or, or, or as it's falling or whatever. This is just making sure that even if their physics gets set back to something other than none, they're still stuck wherever they are. Right. So with that set, we also need to set up the pitch up limit and the pitch down limit. And what, what we're doing here is basically you won't be able to look up or down. It'll just snap the, uh, the pitch to horizontal or to uh, default. And the reason we want to do this is with physics set to none, if you look around, the entire character is actually going to be start rotating. Spinning. <laughs> so you'd have like 180 degrees that your entire character could rotate in midair once you're frozen, which looks kind of weird. It kind of takes away from the whole effect of being frozen. Right. If you can sit there and spiral, spiral around in midair. So we'll just set these two down limit as well. Equal so to pitch up, down li up limit, and down limit are an integer. And what we're doing is one is just a tiny bit uh, looking uh, looking up, and down is just a tiny bit looking down. Um, basically, what we're trying, um, if you set it to zero, the effect won't count the way it's doing the check, and you'll actually be able to look in a full 360. Ah, uh, right. So basically, it'll only be let you look like a hair of a degree up and a hair of a degree down. Right. So really limiting this guy. And as a matter of fact, if you look in the pawn class, that's where those are defined. And the default pitch up limit is something like 18,000, and the pitch down is something like uh, 49,000. Right. Just as a reference to how what your normal range is. So let's go in here and set the free sound. Uh, well, actually, what we're going to do is check if the free sound does not equal none. So make sure that it ha guy. has, in fact, been set in default properties or otherwise. And then just say play sound free sound which has been defined already and basically just uh, calling play sound and free sound is was set in the default property so it should be class or, or sh it should be sound and then some sound slot none is simply what slots are played in well, and slots are generally used for if you want to have like a certain sound but it can't be over uh, overridden like if you were to play sound three times in a row it would it would play that and then it would sound a lot louder. What slots would allow you to do is make sure that you can't override a currently playing sound. Right. In our case, this doesn't really matter, though, since we're doing the check ourselves and not applying the effect over and over again. Mm -hmm. And we just say two times transient, transient volume. volume is just um, is basically a non-replicated default volume, if you want to look at it that way, and making sure it's a little bit louder than that. In that case, two times that. So finally, let me guess. The freeze effect class, you got it. So actually... I was supposed to let you guess, but, you know, got ahead of myself, as I always do. Again, we're doing exactly the same thing. Make sure the effect class is not equal to none, and then just spawn it. So spawn, and then freeze, effect, class, and then pass it P. So with spawn, we have <coughs> what, uh, what class are we going to be spawning, and then who owns a, who's the owner of this class. Um... And after that, we're also specifying a lo location and rotation. Otherwise, it spawns at the current actor, in this case, the combos position. We actually want to spawn it at whoever just got frozen. Right. So at P dot location and rotation. So you know what? After all of that typing, that is the entire timer class. I mean, timer function, if you will. So now, there's one more. One more function to type. What is this? The stop effect, which is happening, as Logan said before, when you run out of um, adrenaline. When you run out of adrenaline, or you die. So function, and this is going to be stop effect, and it's also passed pawn p. Of course, at this point, we already have what's inside of it, but All right, this is back into more of the normal realm of a combo. That's right. Where they just give you access to who's currently uh, using this combo. So the first thing is set up a local variable x pawn. And what we're going to be doing is needing to go through all the uh, dynamic actors and checking to see if they need to be reset back to defaults. So basically, on stop effect, what we need to do is unfreeze everyone who who was uh, possibly frozen. Right, just so they don't, after the combo is finished, they still sit there and go, oh, I can't move. That would be a bad thing. Otherwise, they'd be like frozen for the ex extent of the game, and that would be pretty mean. Yeah, that would be that would be mean. So again, this is going to be an iterator. And this is going to be a for each on all dynamic actors. Because, again, we can't just specify a certain radius. We need to check on anyone currently in the level who might be frozen. And just like our iterator above, this is going to check all X pawns. And we're going to pass it reset pawn. So it's going to store every single dynamic actor that we find inside of reset pawn. So at this point, what we're going to do is say if... And, again, just like we did above, we're going to make sure that we're not resetting ourselves... So does not equal us. 
And then inside of here, what we're going to be doing is resetting this reset pawn's ground speed. So this is just going to equal reset pawn dot default, just to make sure it's back to its default ground speed. So something like that. Now something like that, in fact, it, that. So inside of here, we're going to set. All right. Remember, up here, if he was frozen, we set the physics to none. So now at this point, we need to come in here and say if reset pawn dot physics equals equals yeah. We're also checking to see what the physics is instead of just going ahead and setting it. The reason we're doing this is just in case someone who's not frozen is doing something else like maybe swimming or walking, just don't interrupt that. Don't force set everyone to falling. Only set their physics or only change your physics back. Since we don't know what, because physics can be can differ as you're in the game. You could, you could jump and then be falling. You could be walking on the ground or you could be swimming. Right. So you want to make sure that only frozen people get uh, their physics changed. Yeah, we don't want to mess that perfect harmony up. So we can come in here and just, if he's set to none, set his physics to physics falling. Which, I mean, if he's already on the ground, that means he'll just hit the ground. If he's in midair, well, then falling makes sense. He needs to be falling so he can hit the ground. That's right. And finally, what we're going to do is reset the pitch up limit and down limit to the defaults. So inside of here, we're just going to say reset pawn dot pitch. If I could type limit equals reset pawn dot default dot pitch up limit and Logan if I make any typing mistakes yell scream or do something so all looks good just making sure that they regain their uh, vertical axis of aiming ability because I mean that too would be pretty mean to yeah. you lose the effect but then all of a sudden you can only aim on a horizontal plane yeah that would be kinda mean and bad all at the same time and you know what that is pretty much all we need for functions. So we have, if we scroll back up here, we have our start effect, our timer, which checks the angle uh, between the two and freezes if necessary, and then the stop effect, which says, well, if there's anyone that I froze, unfreeze them, send them back to normal. Now, finally, there's a few more default properties we need to set up, and that's basically all there is to setting up a combo, our Medusa combo. So at uh, first we just went ahead and set all our variables so it would make more sense as we were using them. There's a few other things you want to set though just as um, just more general stuff for a combo. So like our exe message. So the message that happens when you activate it, like one's currently in the game, if you activate the berserk combo, it actually says berserk on the screen. Right, so ours is going to say look away, run away. And the duration, this is a simple one that says how long it's going to last. And then so making the effect wear off pretty fast. This is, this is a pretty powerful effect. I mean, in, in this type of game, being able to move is everything. Right. So people frozen are, well, they're pretty much out of luck. Yeah, completely. So this is an important one, keys. Now, what this means is what order you need to um, do your keys for this, um, for this combo to be to run. activate. So to activate, right. Like, um, like Get my the tongue twisted. Yeah, like the regeneration. You hit back four times. Or invisible, you hit right two times, left two times. Right. So what, we're, what we need to set up is, of course, well, what's the key combo that's going to activate our, our right. combo? Right, and what's good to remember is up is going to be one, down is going to be two, left is four, and right is eight. As a matter of fact, if you don't mind, you might uh, maybe type those com uh, the uh, All right. com put in comments like what those are. Up equals one. Down equals two, and left Just equals four. Just because this makes four. a good reference, this is fun to try to dig around and figure out when you have, and all you see is numbers for keys, and you're trying to wonder, like, okay, well, what key does what? Right, so the first one, the way ours is going to work is going to be um, down, up, up, up. Oh, actually, here's something interesting about the way this keys array works. It's a four-element four array, so you have four key presses for a combo, but it actually starts out backwards. So oh, right, right, right. The, uh, the final element is actually the first key press. So this combo is going to be activated by hitting forward, 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 back. Right. So the so last the one is going to be element zero. So in this case, since we want up, 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 down, the first one is going to be two, since that is down. Exactly. And the second one, of course, no semicolon. Keep getting confused here. The second one is going to be one. Third one is going to be one. Of course, this is zero base. And again, as Logan just pointed out, this is reading backwards. So the first one, the first key you have to press is one, second key is one, third key is one, and the last key is going to be two. So up, 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 down. So pretty much all set up. Now just as a recap, because we kind of got a little bit 
twisted when we got to our angle discussion over here. Just as a quick recap of how this is working, um, again, at the very beginning of the timer class, we get the instigator direction, and all we're doing is pulling from the instigator pawn the rotation, and then converting that over to a vector and putting it inside of instigator dir. Since that only needs to be done once, we do that at the very beginning. Then inside of the loop, every single time, if the current player is not equal to the player that we've just got, or bot or whatever it may be, we come in here and get other dir, which is the direction or the vector of rotation of the player that we've just we've just gotten, so that we can calculate between us and the other player. So so far we've established that yes, someone is within the radius that we're going to be checking. Now, which way are they looking? Right. So at this point, all we're doing is saying, take instigator dir, take other dir, find the dot product of those two. Um, find the arc cosine of that, which is going to give us an angle between those two. And then when we say pi minus arc cosine, it's saying, all right, if they're looking towards each other, um, it's what we're going to basically, well, let me rewind. Zzz, dink. All right, what we need is to say pi minus this angle because of the way it works. Now, I could go into a technical discussion of how this all works, but I, I think I'm, it's better and safer to just say accept it. And then after we get down to here, at this point, all we're doing, if angle is zero at this point, then they're looking perfectly at each other. The reason we're saying less than pi divided by four is, well, it's not too common that two Unreal players are looking perfectly right, at each we other. we need to set up a range which right. counts as the players looking at each other. Because, I mean, in game you have a field of view, and someone can be anywhere in that field of view, but they're still visible. That's right. So inside of here, pi is 180 degrees. If you divide that by 2, what you're going to get is 90 degrees. If you divide that by 2, what you're going to get is 45 degrees. So we have pi divided by 4, that's going to give us 45 degrees. So when we say angle is less than 45 degrees, that's going to give us a whole range, which is very, very cool. Then, of course, we come in here and say, um, let's make sure that they're not already frozen. And all we're using ground speed here for is to tell if the effect is actually um, happening or not. What, would, what could actually be done, if we weren't using ground speed or something that we could count on, we could have always made like an extra Boolean variable That's to right. say like, if the effect is happening or not with this. But since we're looking at a pawn and we're not modifying a pawn, we just need to see, like, has this effect been applied to this guy or not? In this case, his ground speed is not going to be 0 .01 unless we've just set it. Right. Or just point one, right. So we set, if he's not been set, he's not already frozen, we come in here, set the ground speed to point one, set his physics to none so he can't move, and make sure pitch up limit and pitch down limit are set to a really tight range so that he can't look up and down since when we change physics to none, he can start rotating around and do some really funky stuff. And then, of course, we come down here and say, oh, he just got froze, so play a sound, and oh, he just got froze, so do an effect. So simple as that. Then we come to stop effect and just unfreeze everyone. And you know what? That basically wraps up this Medusa combo, how to create it. In the next lesson, what we're going to be doing is creating the mutator so that we can have it mutate across all of our players so that we can start using it inside of the game. So with that, that's going to wrap up this lesson. Thanks.